Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on my locomotive this week and we're going to get started on the control system for the cylinder drain valves. This is a very complicated set of linkages that allow us to open and close the drain valves from the cab of the locomotive. There's a lot of parts to make, so we better get started right now. Previously we made the drain valves underneath the cylinders and now we need to connect all four of them with a series of complicated linkages that allow us to open and close all four of those valves from the cab. That's important for daily driving of this locomotive. Anytime we stop or if the cylinders might be cold for any other reason, we need to open those valves before we start getting underway to push out any water that might be in there. Now, the series of linkages that do this are, as you might imagine, quite complicated because we have to get all the way down underneath the cylinders at the front of the locomotive, connect all four valves, all the way back to the cab. And this is the set of linkages that Kozo has designed to do this. There are three bell cranks, two scotch yokes, a reach rod, and a dogleg drop link. It's a lot of equipment <laughs> required to get mechanical controls all the way down in front. Larger and later locomotives tended to use compressed air or steam to operate the drain valves, which converts all of this into a plumbing problem, which is a lot simpler. But this is an early and a small locomotive, so it is all mechanical. These linkages land roughly here-ish on my actual model to give you a sense of what we're going to be building. This is almost certainly the second most complicated mechanical assembly after the valve gear itself on the entire locomotive. Now this is going to take some time to build. All these little parts all have to be right, and there are a lot of little components in this system. I'm going to start today with the bell cranks and scotch yokes up here at the front. Digging through my scrap bin, I found this nice piece of 4140 that I think I can get pretty much all of these components out of if I play my cards just right. This is a little bit over thickness. All of these bell cranks and yokes and such are conveniently all the same thickness. It's actually a metric dimension, of course, because that's how Kozo has done a lot of these parts. I don't have metric bar stock or I wasn't able to source any, so instead I'm going to go over to the shaper and make some out of what I have. I start by machining opposite sides of the part to give myself parallel faces for a good solid grip in the shaper vise. These simpler cuts are a great opportunity to play with feeds and speeds on the shaper. I'm still getting my feel for it a little bit. Sometimes faster is better, sometimes slower is better, all depending on the tool grind and the material and so on. Then once I've got nice parallel sides, I've got a good solid grip because I'm only holding a fairly thin edge on the part, so that's why it was worth the trouble to parallelize the sides, and that allows me to thin out the stock to the desired metric dimension that Kozo clearly started with when he designed these parts. I've said this before, but it bears repeating, this is an imperial set of drawings that Kozo has designed. He's designed this locomotive in imperial, however, he is in Japan and he has access to metric nominal dimension materials, so he has designed a lot of these parts to be convenient to make, starting with metric bar stock. These parts are yet another example of that. Now, I live in a metric country also, and in principle, I can also source metric bar stock to save this amount of effort. And in fact, Canada is one of the world's major steel producers, so I should have no trouble buying it, right? Well, our biggest customer is you know who, and they don't want metric dimensions, so it's actually weirdly hard to buy metric bar stock in Canada. Anyway, shaper to the rescue. I've got these two blanks now. I've laid out how I'm going to get all of the parts out of them. Don't be intimidated by my precision drawings there. Your drawings don't have to be as accurate as this for you to get a sense of how the parts are going to go in the stock. I'm going to make the scotch yokes first, and I'm going to make both of them end to end on this one piece of bar stock. So I've centered up on the Y and on the X. I'm finding zero on two different scales in the DRO, one for each part. You could use the stored datum feature in the DRO for this, but honestly, if you only need two, it's a lot easier to just use the absolute and incremental scales as two separate origins. The ends of this piece of bar stock are machined, so they are valid references, incidentally. So now I'll drill and ream the two large holes at the end of each of the two yokes. Here as I center drill the start of the next feature, you'll see my hand come off the hand wheel and go up and switch the range on the DRO so that I can translate over to the same feature on the other part. Of course, if you forget to do that at any point, you scrap one of the two parts. Ask me how I know. But not today. I decided to drill the ends of the scotch yoke slots because they are rounded slots. And that'll give me something to shoot for with the slotting operation. 
then I thought, well, I'm here, my references are all set, I'm all set up for drilling, I might as well just chain drill out the rest of the two scotch yokes and the little area in between where the parts are going to meet, just to make sure I have all of the real estate covered. No matter what method I use for cutting these slots, chain drilling is always going to make it easier. The method I did decide on is the shaper. I cut the two pieces apart now, and I'll use a grooving tool on the shaper to finish out that slot down to where it's going to meet the curved bottom. I set that up vertically in the shaper vise, and I'm using a parallel to find the edge of the tool and align it precisely with the edge of the work. And then I can translate over the correct amount with a little bit of arithmetic to get the tool centered on the workpiece. Since that drilling was done centered on the workpiece on the mill using an edge finder, if I center the shaper tool on the workpiece, then they should line up nicely. And then I feed my way down gradually and cut that slot. You, of course, could also do this on the mill with a tiny end mill, but this is a very small slot. I think it's two millimeters, and I really hate tiny end mills. End mills that small are such a hassle. If you don't get your speeds and feeds exactly right, the end mill snaps, and you can't see what you're doing because the spindle is down so low because the end mill is so tiny, and yeah, it's just a hassle. Whereas the shaper is a fun and delightful way to do this. For depth, I went down by eye. That was sufficient accuracy until the sides of the slot that the shaper cut lined up nicely with the tangents of the drilled hole. Then, of course, there was a little bit of needle filing involved to blend some surfaces together because they were cut with different tools, different operations, different setups, and different centering methods. But overall, that came out really nice. Very pleased with that result so far. Dimensionally, that came out really nice. This is the nominal size gauge pin for that slot, and that moves in there nicely, which is important because this yoke is going to be sliding on the pins of the valve spindles. Now I need to thin out the clevis part, as shown in the drawing in the corner. This cut could certainly be done on the shaper as well, but it would have required rotating the vise and other fiddling around. Shaper is fun, but horses for courses. Since I have two of these to make, I made use of an end stop for the X dimension. Save me some indicating. The last bit of shaping required is to round the end and put the little taper on it in the clevis area. I decided it was easiest to do both of those at once over here on my end rounding fixture for the belt sander. I could round the end by swinging it around the pin, and then once I get to final radius, I can just kind of keep going, swing it around a little bit further to create the taper, which you can see I've marked on the part with some layout lines. These parts are so small that the belt sander made quick work of that. Those will need some cleanup and deburring, but otherwise they are effectively done. Looking very good indeed. And since someone's going to ask, the little hole that you see in the drawing is for cross-pinning this to the shaft. We can't do that yet because we need to set the angle of it, so that will be done on final assembly. This scotch yoke forms a bell crank with a matching lift arm, as you can see here, which I made off camera, because it is exactly the same as the similar two-part lift arm on the reversing lever control linkages. So go ahead and watch those previous few videos if you want to see how I made this. Exactly the same part, just slightly different dimensions, including that very tricky angle slot, which was once again done on the shaper. Back to those two pieces of scrap that I prepared earlier. We've used up one on the scotch yokes. Now I'm going to use the other one to make the other bell crank, the L-shaped bell crank. That looks like this, and this is a surprisingly tricky piece because the angle of the bell crank is not 90 degrees, it's 102 degrees, and both legs of the bell crank are tapered. So getting the stock arranged with some kind of reference aligned with the outside edge of the workpiece would be tricky, and there'd be a lot of tricky setups on the mill to maintain those references. So instead, I'm going to do the part entirely with layout. I've got some gauge pins here indicating the rounded ends of all of the ends of the legs and the, where they meet and so on. By this method, I'm trying to ensure that the lift arm will fit fully within the stock that I have. The only important references are the angles between the holes and the distances between the holes. Everything else is cosmetic. So if I can get the holes sufficiently close to the center of my workpiece with leaving enough material to clean up all the way around, then I'll be good to go. So I've marked the main corner hole there. That'll be kind of my reference for the other two. Then I'm setting up to scribe the arc between the outer two holes. Those holes lie on an arc, and the radius of that arc is the important dimension. That sets the distance between the holes, and also gives me my intersection points for the angle of the lift arm itself. 
So I scribe that arc on there. I've set one leg of the lift arm to be parallel to the bottom surface of the stock, which is machined. So I can scribe one line parallel to that. And then from there, get my 102 degree angle, which gives me my intersection point for the other hole with that arc. Then I scribed the outer radius of the two ends and the corner of the part to make sure that they're all gonna fit within the stock. And they don't. This is where I found out my stock is a little bit too small to fit this part. So I made a bigger piece of stock and did all of that again. On the left, you can see my first attempt. It was almost there. I just missed it on the top leg of the lift arm. It was cut off a little bit there and I wasn't comfortable with that. So made a new piece of stock, traced the lift arm on there with plenty of room all the way around it. Now to center up on the first of the holes, I'm gonna use the pointy end of one of my edge finders. If you've ever wondered what that's for, this is one of many uses for it. You can place it in a punch mark and then slide the mill table around until the edges of the point line up with the shank on the edge finder. You can actually feel with your finger quite accurately when this is the case. This is accurate to within a few thousands anyway. For most things, that's gonna be good enough. Then I can center drill, drill, and ream out the first of those holes. The hole to the left of that one I can actually do with the DRO because the bottom leg of the lift arm, as I said, is parallel to that edge of the stock, so that's a valid reference. Then the upper arm, of course, is at a slight angle, so to drill that one, I located it once again with the pointy edge finder trick. With a little bit of practice, don't underestimate how accurate hand layout can be. The entire industrial world for the first hundred years was built with hand layout on surface plates and with similar methods as you see here, long before we had DROs and CNC and everything else. It makes accurate parts if you do it right. Next I'll work on part of the outside of this part. I need to get some material cleared away before I can cut the slot that goes at the top leg of the shape there. So I rough that out on the bandsaw and then I'll set it up on the milling machine thusly and mill down to my layout lines. I've got a parallel on the top of the vise jaw, which allows me to get that layout line parallel to the top of the vise, but above the level of the vise so that I can mill down to that line comfortably without touching the vise jaw. I use the thinnest parallel I have for this task so that I have the most meat on the part down in the vise jaw, but as you can see, I finish comfortably above that vise jaw. I wasn't worried about touching it. Since this is an obtuse angle and a small part, it was easy to do the other inside surface the same way. I didn't have any interference issues with the spindle nose or anything like that, as is often the case in similar parts. I then did the same thing to machine one of the two outside edges, but I'm leaving the other one alone for a minute because I need some meat on that side of the part for the next setup, as you will see. If you look closely at the drawing in the corner, you'll see that there is in fact a slot in the middle of one of the legs of this bell crank forming a clevis. Kozo loves features like this. This one is shallow enough that it would be fairly straightforward to mill it with a tiny end mill. However, I'm already set up to do this with the shaper. I've already ground the correct tool for this because of how many of these tricky slot features we've already done. So for me, it was quicker to do this on the shaper. Also more fun. Have I said how much I hate tiny end mills? Because I, I just, I feel like I need to say it again, because you just, I can't say it enough. Really hate tiny end mills. Anything smaller than 1 8 is just too small. There's another neat trick that the shaper can do, because as that slot gets down to final depth, you can see the tool is going to start hitting the other leg of the part. So I was able to simply shorten up the stroke on the shaper and have the tool stop before it touches the other leg. So it can go through one leg, stop short of touching the other leg, and then go back and do another pass. Pretty neat. Hashtag stupid shaper tricks. The top surface of this stock is still unfinished and not a valid reference, so the hole is my reference for depth on this slot. In order to measure that, I use a reamer and a pin vise to deburr the reference hole, clean that out, which then allows me to get a gauge pin in that hole, and then another gauge pin placed underneath that will allow me to know when I'm at final depth by measuring the distance between the bottom of the hole and the top of the slot, which you can calculate from the drawings. And then to round the ends of this bell crank, I just decided to file it. Filing is one of those things that the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the better you get at it, the more it becomes a go-to. 
once you're kind of pretty good at filing, it becomes the easiest way to do a lot of features like this. The file is always sitting right there on the bench. There's no setup, no indicating, no tapping in, no tool changing. It's just always there. And most of the time it produces sufficiently good results. I have a lot of end rounding tools and fixtures and setups, but because of the weird angles and size of this part, none of them were really a good fit. So good old filing. I'm actually really pleased with that part. It's a really nice looking little piece. And of course, very, very small, as is everything on this assembly. Off camera, I also made these links which join the two drain valves. These were made exactly the same way as the union links on the valve gear. So if you want to see how those were made, go watch the valve gear videos again. Now that is a lot of cool little parts, and those took a long time. So unfortunately, that is all the time I have for you this week. But stay tuned. Next week, we're going to continue on this entire control mechanism. I think you're going to like it. There's a lot of cool parts in it all the way through the system. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen every single time. And I will see you next time.